I'm convinced it'll be a blessing to you. James 3 and verse 2 says, In many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Uh, NIV says, If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. The rest of this passage describes how that like a bit and bridle in the horse's mouth, like a rudder on a ship, so is our tongue in our life. If you're writing it today, you might have said it's like a steering wheel in a car. It's because you use that bit to steer that horse. You use that rudder to steer that ship. Is it true that our tongue, what we say, is the steering wheel of our life? Most Christians don't believe this. Even though it's very plain in the Word of God, most Christians, how do you know they don't believe it, Brother Keith? Because of the way they talk. It's obvious. If you really believed that what you were saying was governing and directing your life, you would watch what you said. And you wouldn't say a bunch of negative and harmful things over yourself. And just by listening to people talk, you can tell they don't believe this. Because they just, they just say all manner of things. But it is true. Everybody said out loud, my tongue is the steering wheel of my life. Well, what if you're going the wrong direction? Huh? I mean, if you're in your car and you're going south and you want to go north. I was just up north. You may not want to go there right now. <laughs> I heard Phyllis was saying I was on the beach somewhere. Man. <laughs> I didn't see any beach up there. We saw ice about that thick on, on every pond and... We just thought we had some winter time down here. Brother, snow's piled up 12, 14 feet high on the sides of the parking lots and stuff. Woo. I think that what they say, Mike, they had like six days above freezing since the first of the year. And every one of them was tired of it. Everybody we talked, they're, they're like, you got room to take me back to practice? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we had a little winter, but we, we're blessed. We're blessed. But you know, wherever you're supposed to be, there's grace to be there. There's grace, the Lord will grace you, and that's where your provision and the plan is at. Um, if your life is, is going the wrong direction, can you turn it? Yes. You can do it with the steering wheel of your tongue. If you're going uh, south in your car and you want to go north, what do you do? You don't just hold the steering wheel and press the accelerator harder and go, I don't want to go this way. I don't want to go this way. you got to turn the wheel. Hallelujah. And as long as you keep saying what's happening, you're not going to turn around. you got to say something different from what you're seeing and feeling if you want to turn it around. Well, it's just it's so hard, and I just can't, no matter what I do, it, doesn't, it never works out for me. And, and this is the biggest mess, and, and, and it's just the biggest mess, and, and it's just the biggest mess. <laughs> if you say so, right? And what folks don't realize, you are holding the wheel in that same direction. You're just reaffirming what's going on. Now, if you want it to be different, you got to say something different. Instead of saying what a mess it is, you need to start saying, we're coming out. And, and even if you don't see anything that indicates that, that's what faith is about. Faith calls those things that be not as though they were. Right? You know, we talked about this in, in other times about calling those things that be not. And some folks, you know, they, they mock people like us and say, oh, that's that confess it, possess it bunch. You know, they're off. Uh, that blab it and grab it and, and, and all that kind of stuff uh, and, and I don't believe in calling things like that well that'd be like calling your dog you know and if you say well it's time for the dog to eat call the dog and then they said well no the dog's not here we said we know that's why we said call him no I don't believe in calling if Spot's not here he's not here yeah so call him nope he's not here well, no. Uh, people say, well, your bills are not paid. That's why I'm calling them paid. Yes. 
Well, your body's not healed. That's why I'm calling it healed. Right? If it looked and felt healed, I wouldn't need to call it healed. If the money was already sitting on the table, I wouldn't need to call it. Call it. Call it. Take the, take the steering wheel of your mouth and turn that thing around and start bringing your life in a different direction. Amen. Say it out loud again. My tongue. My tongue. What, I say what I say is the steering wheel, steering wheel. Of, my life. of my life. Look in Proverbs 20 now, 18, 20. Proverbs 18, verse 20, please. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Are you wanting to increase in this new year, this 2011? You wanting to do better this year than you did last year? It does not start in your checking account. It doesn't start with your contracts or with your customers, your clients. Or, you know where it starts? The increase of your lips is what will cause you to wind up full and satisfied. And then you need to start talking increase. Do not join the rest of the world talking about how bad things are and how high things are and how hard things are. Hard times, hard times cost so much. Nobody's getting anything. Don't you dare say something like that. You need to say, even if, even if they don't understand it, if they say, well, nobody's getting any contracts right. Nobody's getting any work right now. Under your breath, you need to say, I do. That's <laughs> Now, if they don't understand it, you don't necessarily have to say it in front of them, but you better say it to yourself. I do. And it's not because you think you're smarter and better looking or anything than somebody else. It's just you're doing what he told you to do, and they're not. He'd do the same thing for them if they'd quit talking all this unbelief and fear and lack. Everybody said out loud, this is a good year for me. I'm coming up. We're advancing. We're increasing. In every th good thing. It'll be better, It'll be better, 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 better than, it's ever been. than it's ever been. Thank you, Lord. If you believe that, if you say that, Jesus said, if you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe what you say will come to pass, Jesus said, you will have what you said. Did he say it? He said it. People can mock if they want to and do without. I'm going to respect what Jesus said and enjoy. Verse 21 here in Proverbs 18, he said, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit. they eat the fruit of what? Well, whatever you love to talk is what you'll, what you'll eat, what you'll enjoy. Does it matter what we say? How much does it matter? It, it, what's coming out of our mouth is a matter of, of life and death. We're talking life and enjoying that or we're talking death and not enjoying that. Life and death. Go with me to Revelation today, please, and let's look at a, another aspect and part of this. Revelation 12 and 1 Timothy 6. Revelation 12, 1 Timothy 6. We're going to talk today about how to overcome. Are you interested? Yeah. How to overcome anything. How to overcome the biggest problems. Revelation 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him. The previous verse had been talking about the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. But that's not the whole verse. What's the next word? And. So there was something connected with the blood of the Lamb that enabled them to overcome. And what was it? It was the word that they were saying, the words of their testimony. What they were saying testifying in the situation about. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. If it hadn't been for the blood of the Lamb, there wouldn't be anything for us to testify about. That's right. That's right. We wouldn't have any healing. We wouldn't have any forgiveness. We wouldn't have any protection, any, any redemption. 
The blood of the Lamb has procured it for us, has paid it, made, paid for it, made it available to us. But even though it's bought and paid for and given to us, that doesn't mean we'll enjoy it. You know, take the new birth. There are people in the, uh, in the world that are lost, but you couldn't say that Jesus hadn't paid for them to be saved. You couldn't say the blood of the Lamb hasn't taken care of that, but they haven't added the word of their testimony and their faith to appropriate it. How are we born again? Do you remember? Romans 10, 9 and 10 describes it exactly. Put it up on the screen for us if you would please. Romans 10, 9 and 10. What does it say? The first thing? If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And if you'll believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Is confession a vital, necessary part of being saved? No question about it. How did you get born again? You believed the gospel good news that Jesus paid the price for you. You believed that, that the blood of the Lamb paid the price for all your sins and salvation. And you said with your mouth. And you confessed and received Jesus as your Lord. There are many different ways to say it and do it. But you believed it and you said it. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. And you and I were gloriously born again. Yes. Are you glad that you're born again? Well, we should not be shocked that the way we got into the kingdom is the way we will operate in the kingdom. A lot of Christians believe this. You can talk about being born again. Oh, yeah, they believe in confession. Absolutely they do. But then you talk about making confessions over your finances and your, your, your healing and your kids. Oh, no, we don't believe in that. Well, that's, it's the same way you got in the kingdom of God. It's the same way you got born again. It's nothing different. You're just doing the same thing in other areas. You believe it in your heart and you say it with your mouth. How did they overcome the accuser, the devil, and all of his junk? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Say it out loud. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. In Proverbs, the 12th uh, chapter, you don't have to turn there, but just to uh, make note of this important phrase, 12, 6 of Proverbs, it says the last part of it, uh, the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The New Living says, the words of the godly save lives. NIV, the speech of the upright rescues them. What if you get in trouble? What if you got some big problems? Hmm? What can, what can deliver you? What can get you out? The blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. How did you get out of sin? How do you get out of darkness and death? You believed in your heart and you said with your mouth. And you're no longer lost. You got out. You're not going to hell. How many think if you, if you can get out of hell, you ought to be able to get out of a lot of other stuff, right? I mean, you, you, you got out of hell. If you can get out of hell, you ought to be able to get out of debt. That should be easier than getting out of hell. <laughs> but do you remember how you got out of hell? How'd you get out of hell? You believed in your heart? And you said it with your mouth by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. That's how you'll get out of other, other trouble, other problems. Look in 2 Corinthians, or, or they'll put it on the screen for us. 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Well, we, we didn't read 1 Timothy, did we? Let's read 1 Timothy and then we'll look at 2 Corinthians 4. 1 Timothy 6 and 12. It says, fight the good fight of faith. 
Lay hold on eternal life whereunto you are also called. How do you fight the good fight of faith? Well, we know believing's involved, but read the rest of the verse. And you have what? Professed a good profession. That's the same word translated confession. You've professed a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 13. I give you charge in the sight of God who quickens all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a what? What did Jesus do when all the pressure and all the world was coming down on him? He stood up in front of his accusers and he confessed. Amen. The truth. The, the great I am. Hallelujah. And uh, you and I fight the good fight of faith by believing in our heart and saying with our mouth and not changing, not being moved no matter what kind of pressures come to bear. You got to make up your mind what the will of God is. Right? And you believe that and that only. And you say that and that only. And no matter if the bottom falls out of, out of everything, you still say God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. No matter if you've got nine uh, terrible and terminal diagnoses, you still say by his stripes I was healed and with long life he'll satisfy me and show me his salvation. Then you don't change does it take strength to fight that good fight? Oh, you'll, you'll be tempted to get weary and you'll be pressed and you'll feel like saying something different and that's when you've got to be strong and only say what he said. Second Corinthians, second, uh, Corinthians yes, 4 and 13 tells us how the patriarchs did it and tells us we have the same way available to us. He said, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. The Bible says, let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Have we seen more than a couple of scriptures already this morning that this is the way it works? You believe in your heart. And, not just believe in your heart, believe in your heart. And say with your mouth. We're not just delivered and we don't just overcome by the blood of the Lamb. But by the blood of the Lamb and the words that are coming out of our mouth. What we testify of and to in the midst of the trial and the situation. This is why these heroes of faith are in Hebrews 11. All these individuals that saw such miraculous things and such exploits in the things of God, they had the spirit of faith of believing and saying and not being moved. And the, the glorious revelation here is we got that same spirit of faith in us and on us. We can stand and say things in our life like Elijah did on that mountain, that showdown with the prophets of Baal, like Moses did when he was facing the Red Sea. Come on, are you listening? We got that same spirit of faith in us and on us. How does it operate? Tell me one more time. How does it operate? What did it say? We believed. They, they believed and they spoke. And so what do we do? Therefore... We believe and we speak. Why? We've got the same spirit of faith. We believe it and we say it. Now one of the most well-known heroes of faith, uh, if you went to Sunday school when you were little, you learned about David and Goliath. Hmm? Did he face something big? Did he overcome? Do you remember how he did it? Let's go back. We know he did it by the spirit of faith and we already know from the New Testament how the spirit of faith operates. Let's go back and see if we can see it for ourselves Amen. that it's operating the way we're talking about here. Go to 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. 1 Samuel, 
chapter 17. You got a little more time this morning? Now, I know a lot of you are familiar with this story, and that's good. But let's read it like we haven't read it before. And let's let the Lord put us there. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, by the Spirit of God, He, he can put you right in the middle of this thing and let you see it right, right from the 50-yard line. Do you know He can? He can. This is not a fairy tale. This happened. David, obviously, a man who lived, and, and Goliath is a man who lived at this specific time, and these things happen. And, of course, they're not just a historical account, but it's preserved for you and I to remember and feed on why. So we'll know what to do when great, big, ugly stuff comes up in our life. Hmm? Because we got the same spirit of faith. 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies in, in, to battle. And they were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah. And they pitched between Shoko and Ezekiel in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. You got the picture? Yeah. Army on this mountain over here, army on this mountain, valley in between them. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. Anybody know how tall that is? Well, a cubit is from your elbow to the end of your long finger. And so it was six of them, and then a span, which is this long. Nine foot nine is what that works out to be. Somebody say nine foot nine. nine, foot nine. <laughs> this is not an exaggeration. This is how big the dude was. <laughs> now, seven foot five is tall. Yes. You've been around folks that tall? Yes. I mean, you come around a corner, you run into a guy that's seven foot five, you go, whoa. <laughs> I mean, now, you stack another two foot on top of that guy. <laughs> two feet, not two inches. Nine Nine. Nine, nine. He had a helmet of brass on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. That works it out to about 120 pounds. That's his fighting jacket. Hmm? Come on. Think about it. If he walked up beside you, nine, nine. He's looking down, what, four or five feet. <laughs> and he says, hey, hold my coat for me. <laughs> you get a hold of his coat, boom, 120 pounds. Now, he, he doesn't just have this, he fights in this coat. So you've got a lot of muscle mass to be able to fight and move athletically in this kind of gear. But because it was so big and thick, see, most people couldn't fight anything like that. You would want to. Why? Because the bigger and thicker means nobody can stab through it. He could wear stuff that was so thick and heavy that the average guy could wail on him with his sword and it wouldn't even penetrate. And then he can reach up from three or four foot above boom, and take you out. You can't hurt him. And uh, the Bible said he had uh, greaves of brass on his legs, target of brass between his shoulders. Uh, I mean, he is virtually covered with impenetrable material. And uh, his staff of his beam was like a weaver's beam. His spear was like a pole. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. That's something like 15 or 20 pounds. Just the head of the spear, not the whole thing. And, and one bearing a shield went before him. It took a, a regular big guy just to tote his shield. 
in front of him and he comes behind with all this gear. He stood and cried to the armies of Israel and he said, why are you come out to set the battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And your servants of Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. And if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. There's no need in the whole army is going fighting. I'm a Philistine. Pick your best guy. Come on, let's fight. We'll save a lot of war and time. <laughs> but nobody volunteered. <laughs> the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight. Are you men? You don't have a man in the whole bunch? I thought you came here to fight. Fight? Here I am. And the Bible said he did this for a month and a half, twice a day. That's plenty of time to cuss. And the Bible said he, he cursed God and he cursed the Israelites. And he said, I'm sure he said bad things about their relatives and their family. And he did everything he could to provoke them. He wants to kill somebody. And we, we see later in the chapter, he has been a, a warrior since he was a boy. And apparently nobody's killed him. Everybody he's fought with is dead. And not only is he nine foot nine and all this mass and weight, he's skilled. He's a skilled warrior. And there were some big and tough guys in the armies of the Israelis. But there wasn't a man in the whole bunch that would consider going hand to hand with this guy. And so then King Saul starts making incentives. And he says, if anybody could find the courage to go fight this guy, that he will give him X amount of money. He can marry uh, the king's pretty daughter and become part of the royal family. And he never has to pay taxes again the rest of his life. And still, not one taker. None. I'm sure they sit around and talked about all that money and the pretty girl and no taxes, but then one's got to say, well, it ain't going to do you no good if you're dead. <laughs> and so nobody, nobody found the courage to face him. Verse 11, Saul and all Israel heard those words and the Philistine, and they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. David, the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, whose name was Jesse, he, Jesse had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to battle. The names of these were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. He wasn't old enough to be at the battle. If you read the, the rest of the passage, it says he was a youth. We'd probably call him a teenager. Because if he'd have been old enough, you know, they, they needed every man they could get. He wasn't old enough to be there. And uh, he went and returned to Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Twice a day times 40, 80 different times. This guy had come and railed and blasphemed and challenged and provoked and cussed. And Jesse said to David, his son, Take now for your brethren an ephah of parched corn, ten loaves, run to the camp to your brethren. Carry these ten cheeses to the captain of the thousand, and look how your brethren fare, and take their pledge. And Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper, and he took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array army against army. David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran to the army and came and saluted his brethren. As he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spoke according to the same words that he had been speaking for 40 days. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. He just, he just walked. You know, the armies are, are, are supposed to be meeting for battle in the valley. 
Goliath walks up to the front and all the Israelites just get out of the way. They just back up and retreat. Nobody will face him. Nobody will meet him. And so he just starts marching back and forth and yelling and blaspheming and, and challenging and provoking again. And David was there just in time to hear it. And uh, they fled. They were sore afraid. He must have been one imposing bad dude. And they said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he's come up. And it'll be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches. What, what would great riches be like? He must be talking about today's money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, more. And he'll give him his daughter. And he'll make his father's house free in, fa in Israel. Their whole family never have to pay taxes. David spoke to the man that stood by. He said, what shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Because who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now, friend, something we can learn from this. It is very important how we refer to our problem. Hmm? You don't refer to the disease that has attacked you as the most awful, untreatable, incurable thing there is on the planet. Yes, sir. Hmm? You don't refer to your money problems as unpayable, humongous. Hmm? They're looking at nine foot nine and bad to the bone. And what does he say? Uncircumcised. Philistine. That's about as strong as cussing as he could come. <laughs> but, but, but this is not meaning this words. Uncircumcised means no covenant. No covenant with God. No connection with God. No help from God. And here he is a cussing and blaspheming God. Who is he? What's he saying? He is nobody. And that's how you need to talk about your issues. Yes. What about your debt? It's nothing. That's right. I wouldn't say $83,000 was nothing. You better talk about it right because the more impressed with it you are, the further away from getting free from it you are. When you're in awe of how bad and terrible and hard your situation and how big the bill is, you're not in faith. Faith does not go on and on about the problem. Faith is not in awe of the difficulty. Faith is in awe of God. Faith is in awe of the provider, the healer, the protector, the deliverer. We're not going to talk about how bad the problem is. We're going to talk about how big God is. That's what he's doing. You want to get free from that thing? You want to overcome that thing? You want to beat it? Start talking it down. Start talking it down. He ain't going to talk about how big the spear is. He ain't going to talk about how tall the guy is. He's not going to talk about what a war is. He's going to talk about uncircumcised Philistine. He, he's not anything. He's got no covenant with God. He, he, he's not. Who is he? Who is he? What's cancer in front of God? Come on, someone needs to help me out. What, what's diabetes in front of the power of the Almighty? What's $100,000 to God? What's what? A million dollars to God. It's, what, it's nothing. Uncircumcised Philistine. You got to look down your nose when you say it. Uncircumcised Philistine. Come on, somebody needs to try it out. Let's say, Uncircumcised Philistine. That's what your debt is. That's what your problem is. What your sickness is. Uncircumcised Philistine. And he says, uh, say again, how much they say they'd pay the guy that kills this thing? They said, you know, $500,000. 
And, and which daughter is he talking about? Oh, the pretty one. Ooh, I seen that girl. Mm. And no taxes forever? Your whole family never pay taxes again? Mm -mm -mm. Who is this guy that's uncircumcised Philistine? Well, Eliab, his older brother, overheard him. And uh, he comes up. Verse 28. And he said, uh, why did you come down here? Because he overheard him talking like he was talking. And he said, what have you, uh, who have you left those few sheep in the wilderness with? He's accusing him of being negligent in his duties. I know your pride, the naughtiness of your heart. The, the word naughty here is Hebrew for evil and, and bad. You're full of pride and got a bad heart. I know you. You just come down here to see the battle. And David said, what did I do? What have I done? Is there not a cause? Somebody ought to be doing something around here. Get this uncircumcised Philistine out here cussing God for a month and a half. Let's just stop right here. Why did Eliab talk like this to him? Embarrassment? Are you with me? Pride? Envy? Why? Faith shows up unbelief. When somebody, when everybody's been in unbelief, and everybody's talking fear and doubt and failure, and somebody comes in and talks faith, everybody else look around and go, huh, who does he think he is? Everybody in three counties knows how bad it is around here. He waltz in talking about what he's going to do. If they'd humble themselves, they'd go, Right, I should have been saying that. Yeah. And get on board. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be prideful, you'll, then you'll mock and you'll accuse and you'll try to lash out against them when you're the one who's got the problem. Right. You're the one who's got the deficiency. You should be doing what they're doing. Uh -huh. yes. So they attacked him. But notice what he did. Uh, verse 29, when he said, you know, what have I done? Verse 30, he just turned away from him and turned right to somebody else and said, tell me again, how much money they said they paid? <laughs> what, what will happen to the man that, that killed, takes this guy out what why does he keep asking I think he got the information right the first time why does he keep asking this question because something is going on inside of him he's getting stirred that he's supposed to do something and he needs to make sure before he goes out there to dance with this guy Right? He needs to know that he's heard from the Lord. Doesn't he? And so he keeps asking. And they keep telling him. And he keeps asking. And this guy's brother wants to come down on him. And he just turns to somebody and says, like I said, how much? <laughs> well, well, don't, don't let people sway you. Don't let them talk. When God starts stirring something up in you and you can see it's time for you to believe something and to say something, don't let people talk you out of it or, 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 or try to shame you or, or talk you down. or don't, don't do it. Just turn to somebody else and say, tell me again. Till you get it settled in you. And when the words were heard uh, which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. Now, think about this. This is an army of men, warriors. This is a kid. If you read the rest of it, the Bible said he was ruddy. Now, that's old English. It means reddish. He had reddish hair and, and a red, fair complexion. And he's a teenager. He's a good-looking kid. He's not a great, big, scarred, hulking warrior. But he starts talking and his words were so convincing that these guys say, the king needs to hear this guy. And these great big warriors catch this kid by the arm and says, come on, you need to go see the king. Why? Why? Because of what was come, because of the words. Is that right? Because there was something different about the words that were coming out of his mouth. And verse 32, they brought him in front of Saul. And Saul said, let no man's heart fail because of this, because of him, because of Goliath. Your servant, me, I'll go fight this Philistine. 
I'll go. Verse 33. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're just a youth. He's been a man of war from his youth. From the time Goliath was a boy, he was learning how to kill and fight. He's not just 9'9". Nine, nine. He's an athlete. He's skilled killer. He's got the biggest, most advanced weapons. He's got as much muscle as two or three men. And you're just, you're a kid that watches sheep. You, you, no way you can go. Verse 34. David said to Saul, your servant, he's talking about himself, kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion. And there came a bear. I'm talking about two different incidents, I guess. And took a lamb out of the flock. Verse 35, and I went out after him. Say what? <laughs> you did what? <laughs> a lion came and grabbed a lamb to eat and, and was taking it off. A lot, of, a lot of folks would go hide somewhere. David runs after the lion. Man, faith will do something for you. Faith will give you courage. He ran after the lion. He caught him. And, and uh, he smote him. And, and when he smote the lion, he dropped the lamb. He got it out of his mouth. But then the lion turned uh, and rose against David. I guess he said, well, I'll just eat you. <laughs> and he caught him. You know, lions have this, this, this beard. He caught this lion by the beard. This is face to face, hand to hand with a lion. And he's a boy. He's a kid. And he killed him. Smote him and killed him. How did he do this? It wasn't by mass. It wasn't by sheer strength. He's a kid. I mean, no teenager against lion. Lion's going to win every time. Unless you add something else in. Right? He did it by faith and he did it by the help of the Lord. And verse 36, your servant slew both the lion and the bear. Same, thing, same type of thing happened with the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, he's not going to talk about how big he is, how bad he is. He just a no covenant nobody. <laughs> He's tall. He's bad. No, no. He's a no covenant nobody. What about what's been messing with you and attacking you and bothering you? It's a no covenant nobody. Because if they don't have God to help them, and if God's for us, it's not even a fair fight. I don't care if they make 10 of us. They don't make 10 of God. He said, this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. He didn't say he's made me mad. That's right. That's right. Very important distinction. He said he has, he's defied the armies of the living God. He's blasphemed him. Verse 37, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered my... Now, come on, come on, stop right here. What's David doing right now? Help me out. What's he doing? He's talking. What's the, what does the spirit of faith do? It believes. And it says, listen to what he's saying. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will. Y'all pray. Huh? I'm going to go and do what I can. And you know, you just never know. What the Lord's going to do, but, huh? No. This story wouldn't be in here. That's right. That's right. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Say it out loud. He will deliver me. Who will? God will. He might. We'll see. We hope so. We don't know. See, this is how faith talks. Faith is convinced of the will of God. 
Faith knows what God's going to do before it happens. And so it decrees it. Say it again. He will deliver me. He will. You got a little extra time? Hold your place here and go to Daniel. Daniel, the third chapter. On the way over there, say it again. He will will. deliver me. me. Without reading the rest of that verse, as soon as he said that, you know, Saul had just told him, you can't go. You can't fight this dude. And David made his little speech. uh, Lion and bear speech. And the punchline was, God delivered me out of the hand, paw of that bear. He delivered me out of the paw of that lion. Somebody say, amen, David. <laughs> and he will deliver me out of the hand of this uncircumcised filly. And as soon as he said that, Saul said, well, go. Go. He talked to him. He convinced him. Because prior to that, he said, you a boy, you can't go. There was something about the words that were coming out of David's mouth. That even though they're looking at a red-headed, fair-complected little teenage guy, that they thought, okay, uh, all right, do it. What? Faith is inspiring. Now, Daniel 3, I want you to notice something that's been a, a, a... an issue that I I think a lot of folk have gotten wrong. And I want you to, this is our church and I'm your minister and I want you to know real plain what I believe about this. (laughs) Is that okay? Hey, you can do do what you want to with it, but I'm talking about not just my opinion, but what I believe the word says plainly in this area. This is the story where uh, Nebuchadnezzar the king made his great image and commanded everybody when the music played to fall down and worship it. And you remember when everybody did except the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember that? And then they sent word to him that they're not bowing down and oh, it made him mad and they sent word and they brought him in front of the king. Remember that? And in verse uh, chapter 3, And let's see, Uh, what about verse 14 or so? Can you put that up for us? Daniel 3.14, Nebuchadnezzar spoke and he said to them, Is it true? O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve my gods? And don't worship the golden image which I have set up? Is it true? Verse 15, now if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackment, psalter, dulcimer, all kinds of music. You fall down and you worship the image which I have made. Well, in other words, we'll forget about this incident. Hmm? Yeah. And you won't perish. You won't be thrown in the fire furnace. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fire furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Let's just stop right here. These three boys, are they in Hebrews 11? Hmm? These boys have faith? Did they see miracles? This spirit of faith we're talking about, did they have it? No question about it. So what did it look and sound like? Next verse. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, and they said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. This is big talk. This is big talk. They said, we don't need any time. We ain't got to confer among ourselves. We don't have to think about this. We got your answer right here, right now. (laughs) Verse 18, excuse me, 17, 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Does that sound familiar? Yes. That sounds just like what we're reading over here with David, right? With David, sounds just like it. 
Verse 18, but if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. I've heard a lot of commentary on this and numerous different people preach on this. And in my opinion, they got it wrong. And even a lot of your modern translations will reword it and add words that are not in the text. And the way that they bring it across is like these boys said, uh, if, you throw, if you throw us in, you know. Uh, well, back to verse 17. Let me say it exactly like it says it. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. Verse 18. But if not, and some translation says, if he doesn't deliver us. It's in half the modern translations that way. If he doesn't deliver us, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. They did not say that. They could not have said that because that's not how faith operates. Somebody said, well, yes, it is now, Brother Keith. They were showing their consecration that no matter what happened, uh, they, no, no, that's wrong. That is incorrect interpretation of the Scripture. Literally, the, the Scripture says, verse 17, in the literal, it says, lo, it is, and verse 18, and lo, not. That's exactly what it says. Lo, it is, lo, not. Not. <laughs> now anything else that people come up with is added. That's right. How do you translate that? Go back to verse 17. I know I'm taking a little time with this, but I, I, I think it's worth it. Yeah. If it be so. Stop right here. If what be so. If what be so. That's where people get in trouble. You got to go back to the previous verse. Verse 16. 15, excuse me. If you be ready, you fall down and worship. But if you worship not. If you fall down, it's going to be fine. I'm not going to throw you in. If you worship not, you're going to be thrown in. Next verse, verse 16 and then verse 17. If it be so. If what be so? If you throw us in. Are y'all with me, friends? You see how folks have twisted that? If you throw us in, we want you to know something. Our God that we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and He will deliver us out of your hand. Verse 18. And there's no way that they said, but if he doesn't. Because what does that do to the phrase? He will deliver us, but if he doesn't. There's no faith in that. You don't know the will of God. If it be so, if what be so? If you throw us in. If it be not, it's what? If you don't throw us in. Be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden age. Now, if, it's, if God doesn't deliver them, then I, is it necessary to say we're not going to serve your God if we're burnt to a crisp? <laughs> I think that'd be pretty self-evident. Yeah. <laughs> They're saying, if you don't throw us in, we're still not going to serve you, God. Right. Right. You try to be magnanimous, magnanimous and you're not going to throw us in, we're not going to bow down. We're not going to do it. Right. But if you throw us in, yeah. and you want to know what kind of God can deliver you, yeah. our God that we serve yeah. is able to deliver us, and He will deliver us. He will. He will. He will. And this thing about, but if he don't, that is wrong. That is not what the scripture said, and that is contrary to anything you'll learn about faith. Faith begins where the will of God is known. 
Faith comes by hearing. And through hearing, you find out the will of God. Yes. Then you can stand and boldly say. Yes. Amen. Everybody with me on this? Yes. No, the if and if not is if you throw us in and if you don't. Is that okay with you here? Yes. Do you know why I'm talking about this? I mean, there's a lot of people preach that that way and it's, not, it's faith destroying. It's wrong. Back to 1 Samuel 17. Do we see that spirit of faith in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That's such boldness. Such clarity. Did God deliver them out of the burning fire for them? Was he able? Then he did exactly what they said. He proved and showed that he was able. And they have their own verses in Hebrews 11. Don't they? 1 Samuel 17. Where were we? You remember the verse? 37. That's right. Thanks, guys. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. I can hear somebody going, Amen. <laughs> and the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the bear. Amen. That's right. He will. He will. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And his words were so powerful and had such a punch that Saul said, go. And the Lord be with you. <laughs> and verse 38 he looked at him again and realized how small he was and said, man, let's put some armor on you at least. And they tried to put the armor on him. And you know, Saul was a tall guy himself. And so, you know, he's several inches taller than, than David, I'm sure. And, and so he's, his, probably his coat of mail is hanging off of his hands and he can't walk in it and the sword's dragging the ground. He said, I can't, I can't go like this. I don't know what to do with this stuff. No, y'all got to take it off of me. So they took it all off. And he got his stick. Him and his stick's been through some stuff, and he knows. <laughs> and he went down to the brook, and he picked him out some real smooth stones that were just the right caliber. <laughs> and he put them where he could get his hand right on them. And he checked his sling out and made sure the strap was right and it felt good. <laughs> Get the picture. Red-headed teenager with a stick and slingshot. And he came out to the, uh, the battle area. Let me see, I can find my scripture again. And the scripture said that, uh, verse 41, the Philistine came on and, and drew near to David. The man that bare the shield went before him. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. Now, first of all, he's looking about. He's thinking, where's the guy I'm supposed to fight? See, he's got a big guy in front of him toting his shield. He sees a kid out here with a stick. He don't, he, they don't even compute to him. He don't even register. He's like, where's the guy at? And somebody said, that's him. <laughs> this, this kid with no armor, no shield, no bow, no spear, no blade. Kid with a stick. Then it made him mad. He's insulted. He looked about, he disdained him. Because he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair complexion. And the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog? Did you come to me with a sticks? And Phil the Philistine cursed David by his gods. By his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me. I'm not talking low enough. Come to me. <laughs> I will give your flesh to the fowls of the air. Beast of the fear. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, if you're nine nine, you got to have a low voice, don't you? <laughs> I mean, your vocal cords are that long. <laughs> Then said David, I want you to back up. Are you, are you looking at your scripture? Yeah. Verse 29, what does it say? Verse 29. And David said, verse 32. And David said, verse 34. And David said, verse 37. David said, moreover. Verse 45. Then said David. What's going on here? There's some saying going on. David said, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. That's what that giant's faith was in, was in his strength, his stature, his skill, and his armament and weapons. But I'm coming to you in none of that. That is not what I'm trusting in to win this battle. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel that you have stood out here and cussed for the last month and a half, that you have defied, you have taken on the wrong. You're looking at me, but you have messed with the wrong one. It's the God that I serve. Now think about this. Red-headed teenager with a stick and some rocks and a slingshot. But what courage. What courage. How did he get such courage? Faith. Faith gave him that kind of courage. We don't have to look back and long to have something like that. Did we not just read in the New Testament that we got the same, same spirit of faith that they had? Verse 46. This day, what's David still doing? Today will the Lord deliver you into my hand. None of this, y'all pray, we hope so, we'll see, you just never know. Today, see faith knows ahead of time what the Lord's going to do. Today the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I'm going to smite you and I'm going to take your head off of you. Not I'm going to try. Not I'm going to give it my best shot. And I will give, and I'm not going to stop with you. I'm going to give the carcasses of this whole bunch of the Philistines today to the fowls of the air, all your buddies too, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know what a tough teenager I am. No, 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 no. That they may know that there is a God in Israel. Our God. He's talking about my God. Verse 47, and all this assembly, everybody that sees it and hears about it, they will know that the Lord don't save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. How many times have we heard will? He will, he will. He will, he will. He will. And there ain't no way he could have come in and said, but if he don't, can you see that? There's no way, no how. If you do that, there's no faith anymore. Verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and he came and drew nigh to meet David. Here he comes. Kung, 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 kung. David didn't wait for him to get there. He hastes, he breaks and runs toward this big dude. Faith is not afraid of the problem. Faith doesn't talk about how big and how bad, and how awful and how terrible and, and how much the price. Faith runs toward it to take it out. 49, David put his hand, he's running and he slips his hand down his back and he finds that 45 caliber stone. <laughs> And he loads it in his sling. And he's a running. He's done this before. He's been out in the field and, and, and dealt with beasts and all this stuff. And I, what do you do all day and all night when you're sitting around watching the sheep? Pow. Pow. Pew. Man, he could pick petals off the flowers. He, uh, all day long. So, man, you. 
Zoof. Wow, he turns it loose. And I mean, just as straight as a bullet. Boom. And the Bible says, you know, this guy has got this 120 pound coat of mail. He's got this big shield on his back. He's got all this brass on his leg. He got this big helmet. None of it did him any good. He had a little open spot right there. And <laughs> boom, that big rock hit him right. And the Bible said it sunk down into his forehead. That means it broke his skull. I mean, it's like he's shot. Now, if David had thought about that previously and thought, well, if this guy starts, if I get in close quarters with him, what can I do with him hand to hand? That's right. He could have thought about that and chickened out. He didn't need to do any hand to hand with the guy as it turned out. <laughs> what, I mean, what can I do if he starts swinging that blade? I don't even have a sword. As it turned out, he didn't need a sword. The guy's laying flat on his face. He just pulls his sword out and just does him in with it. Yeah. Takes his hand off. How do you overcome even the biggest, even the scariest, even the toughest problems? How do you do it? You do it the same way that they did it. You do it the same way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and David, and Elijah, and all of them. You believe it in your heart, and you say it with your mouth. Come on, can you say glory to God? Hallelujah! And you will see the same kind of amazing things. Next thing you know, they'll be reading your testimony up here. Stand on your feet, everybody. Thank you, Lord.